is after 15, uh, 15 weeks of pregnancy, which is well before viability and patently unconstitutional. So the fact that the court took the case is very concerning because there's really no reason to do that unless they're planning to make some significant changes to the current standard um, around how abortion laws are reviewed. So we and everybody else were sort of focused there. And then because of some strange legal maneuverings, the Texas law kind of came about. Um, I'm sure many of you have probably heard about it, but there's a lot going on in the world. So it's possible that you haven't. So what we're talking about is this bill known as Texas SB8, so Senate Bill 8. Um, it's referred to a couple of different ways. Some people call it a six-week ban. Some people call it a heartbeat bill. That's what the um, the anti-abortion folks call it, but we should be clear that it, um, what it does is it bans abortion at six weeks of pregnancy, and that's so early that a lot of folks who are pregnancy have no, have pregnant have no idea that they even are at that time. So there's no way to get an abortion before then if you don't even know you're pregnant. Um, what Texas did that's so unusual, because they know that this statute is unconstitutional, is they set it up so that no actual state officials will enforce it. They said, we're not gonna do anything to enforce it. And, and the reason that's important is because that's usually how we get these laws stopped in court is, is that abortion providers usually sue the state officials who would be enforcing the law. It goes to court and the courts review it. And in this case would have said, well, this is obviously unconstitutional. The state didn't want that to happen. So instead they said, you know what we're gonna do, we're gonna deputize every private citizen in Texas instead to enforce this law. So it's literally a sort of a bounty hunter system it empowers citizens to sue anybody connected with the abortion except the woman who gets the abortion with a minimum of $10,000 reward if they're successful. And that includes a cause of action for aiding and abetting an abortion. So depending on how the law is construed, anyone who helps a woman get an abortion in addition to the physician who performs it could be subject to ruinous financial uh, civil, civil liability. So advocates, filed a federal court challenge anyway. Um, they're trying to find a way to get into court and stop it by suing basically the state courts in Texas because those are the that's where these lawsuits would have to actually be adjudicated. And that case went up to the Supreme Court on an emergency basis two weeks ago because this law was slated to go into effect and did go into effect on September 1st. Um, the Supreme Court uh, in an unsigned opinion basically did nothing. They said, you know what, we're just gonna kind of let these proceedings play out and see what happens. They said, you know, it's, there's some concerns, it might be unconstitutional, but we're just not really ready to weigh in yet, which was a huge, they did a whole lot by doing nothing really. And there were some very strident dissents. Significantly, even conservative Chief Justice John Roberts dissented from what the Supreme Court refused to do two weeks ago. And they let this law go into effect. So effectively, there is virtually no abortion access right now in, in Texas. And I think it's, it's sort of significant to pull back a little bit and think about whether the Supreme Court would have done the same thing if a different constitutional right were at issue. You know, a lot of folks have put forth this hypothetical, you know, what if California or New York had said, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna ban, we're gonna ban guns, but we're not going to enforce that ban. We're gonna let private citizens do that instead. So neighbors can sue each other about gun ownership. I think a lot of people suspect the Supreme Court might have done something a little bit different in that case, but um, you know, abortion is often treated somewhat differently in, in the kind of panoply of constitutional rights. So in, right now, it seems like the only way to get this law stopped potentially is if somebody is actually sued under it and they go to court to defend themselves and then maybe they can get the the law stopped. But last week, actually, the, the US Department of Justice filed a, a suit against Texas to try to get the law stopped. And they're trying to get um, a temporary restraining order. So there is another potential pathway to get it stopped. But I, I think it's just really worth noting how sinister and pernicious this approach is to enjoining constitutional rights. Because the state essentially, by doing it this way, admitted that the law was unconstitutional and really decided to pit the citizens of Texas against one another so that those who oppose abortion can really go after those who are trying to access this healthcare and um, you know, bring the whole system down with these financial penalties. And we're already seeing legislators in other states threatening to introduce copycat bills. And you know, as Shannon is, I think, gonna talk about a little bit later, this kind of approach could spread to other issues, including ones that really strike close to home for, um, for our community. So I'll stop there and I think turn it over to Kathy. 
Great. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you for the overview. And I think um, just explaining the sort of sinister and nature and breadth of this law, um, I think really does show how incredibly more difficult and impactful it is on certain communities. Because it has no exceptions and has such a broad reach, it impacts anyone who can't leave the state of Texas in order to get health care or and who are in need of anything that would be considered an abortion. So that particularly impacts minors, um, especially minors who are survivors of sexual abuse and are pregnant as a result. Um, minors in detention facilities obviously have no ability to leave the state. And of course, low income people, it's expensive to do, to try to go to another state. And Texas is a very large state. Um, it's not easy for many people to leave the state to get health care. Um, so certainly the impacts of this are not the same on all groups of people. Also, I think something that people may have seen stories about but isn't discussed as much is that there's a huge impact also not just on people who have pregnancies that wish to end their pregnancies, but even people who have a medical condition that's going to endanger their health or life or knowledge that their pregnancy is not viable, that they are, that their child cannot survive um, birth and need a procedure for their own safety and also just for not having to carry an entire pregnancy, knowing that there's no possibility of having a baby, um, that that is a common medical practice that people choose to use when something happens that the, the, you do not have a viable pregnancy. And that is also foreclosed. So this is such a broad impact and really touches on a lot of people in a lot of different situations. Thanks, Kathy, for putting a, an even finer point on some of the impact on, on communities. Um, we care about everybody affected, but some people are going to, as you've pointed out, really have a harder time exercising their rights because not everybody can get on an airplane and leave the state and go someplace where they can get the care they need. It's simply, you know, financially un, not an option. So um, I want to talk a little bit, I guess, about why, why this matters to us as an organization and as a movement and what NCLR is doing um, with respect to both this law and, and other similar issues. Um, I'll say personally, you know, I actually I worked in the reproductive rights movement before I, I came to NCLR. And um, one of my favorite things about being here, in addition to the great folks I get to work with, is that I still am working on reproductive rights issues as well as issues of LGBT equality. And you know, really I don't see those movements as distinct. There's a there's a really strong overlap because you know, what opponents of abortion rights and opponents of LGBTQ equality are really trying to do is take from all of us the ability to live our lives the way we know is, is right and true for us and is our best interests, ourselves, our families. They wanna tell us how to form our families, how not to form our families. So to me, it's really all one big kind of sinister movement to control people and not let us you know, be who we are. Um, I'm also honored to be on the board of an organization called Abortion Care Network, which is um, it's kind of exactly what it sounds like. It's a network of independent abortion providers around the country. These are the community-based clinics um, like the ones who often challenge these laws. Like you may have heard of Whole Woman's Health. They, they brought one of the big Supreme Court cases a couple of years ago. And last year there was a Supreme Court case called June Medical Services. That was another independent uh, clinic. So I'm on the board of that organization that really keeps me very tuned into the realities of the wonderful people who are every day going to work to make access to reproductive health care a reality for people. It's one thing to have a constitutional right on paper, but there actually have to be people on the ground who have clinics who are there to, to provide the services. So being part of ACN, NCLR is an organizational member of ACN and I get to serve on the board in that way. So we are very much involved in the mobilization that's that's you know happening now around well Texas and all the other places where these terrible laws are being passed. And we're really um, collectively trying to take our lead from the groups on the ground. You know, those folks who are in Texas providing care, um, raising money for patients to be able to get care, they're the ones who really know how best to mobilize. And we want to, as a national group, really take the lead from them. Um, one thing that I, you know, I, I, put, I published a, a commentary in the Blade the, the week that the Texas law went into effect because like so many people, we as an organization and me personally, we were so outraged that this could happen and that the Supreme Court would allow it to. 
Um, so I don't know if maybe there's a way we can drop a link to that if folks want to see kind of how we see all these things really linked into the work that we do. The other thing that we're doing um, almost as we speak is we're getting ready to file what's known as an amicus brief or a friend of the court brief in that Mississippi case that I was talking about a few minutes ago, that 15 week abortion challenge. And that's going to be on behalf of NCLR and a number of our LGBTQ movement partners saying, look, we're paying attention to this. We care about this. This matters to us. It impacts sexual minority women. It impacts trans and non-binary folks. And you can't just sort of slip this, slip this in under the rug. You know, we're paying attention and we care. And here's how it impacts our community. So that's one of the, the ways we've really kind of carved out an important niche um, at the intersection of these movements for reproductive rights and LGBTQ equality. So I think um, Shannon might want to say a little bit more about the amicus brief and, and I'll turn it over to him. Yes, uh, I love our amicus brief. I just want to give, uh, in the Mississippi abortion case, I just want to give a huge shout out to Julie, who just spoke for taking the laboring or and drafting that brief and just for being um, such, uh, you know, helping NCLR be such a strong supporter of reproductive freedom and women's right to abortion. I'm so proud and happy to work for an LGBTQI organization that supports uh, those important freedoms for, for women. Yeah, what I want to say a little, to tag on a little bit about that, because we've, oh, and I also want to give a, a shout out there to Morrison Forrester, who is our co-counsel in that brief, and wonderful team, including Deanne Maynard, who is like one of the leading Supreme Court litigators in our country. And it's just, it's always such an honor uh, to work to work with them. It's an awesome brief. I look forward to y'all all being able to read it. But as Julie said, uh, the brief is on behalf of a bunch of LGBT groups. It's but it but we are making the argument in this brief full on, straightforward that abortion bans, abortion restrictions discriminate based on sex. They are sex discrimination measures, and that they subordinate women. That this is fundamentally about women's equality. And one of the things that um, I love about the brief and about um, working with Julie and Kathy and the other folks at NCLR is we are trying to model an approach to intersectional issues and um, to the, in, in this case, in particular, the intersection of women's issues and, and issues that affect members of the LGBTQI community that is a both and approach, not an either or, not a zero sum. So our brief, I really feel we worked so hard on it. I look forward to y'all all reading it and I look forward to any input anybody has, but, and I'm sure it's not perfect yet, but we're trying to both, you know, center um, women in this issue because women are at the center of abortion and abortion restrictions, and yet also be inclusive of, uh, well, certainly lesbian women, bisexual women, but also transgender men and non-binary people who are assigned female at birth who are also affected by abortion bans. But it is, I'll just be honest, it's not easy to do all that at the same time. And we're, uh, I've, I'm excited. I feel like this brief has really pushed our thinking uh, on that really forward. And um, again, I'm just happy for, for you all to read it soon. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to shift over to is like the, the implications of what Texas just did with this whole vigilante private enforcement business around uh, restricting other people's abortion rights. I am, look, I'm ringing the five alarm fire bell here because the fact that, that Texas is getting away with this, the fact that honestly, y'all, there has not been the kind of national outcry there should be about this Texas law, the Supreme Court just let it go into effect. This is, these are classic authoritarian tactics where we're just being lied to all the time. Like these are these underhanded subterfuge tactics where Texas isn't saying, oh, we're gonna get rid of abortion. They're saying, oh, oh no, we're not, you can't have six weeks to get an abortion. Uh, that's exactly what Mississippi said too. Oh, you have 12 weeks to get an abortion. The Supreme Court, they're not saying, oh yeah, we're, ha we're gonna just, we're reversing Roe v. Wade and we're gonna let uh, states nullify the right to abortion. They're like, oh, you know, we're just not sure who's going to enforce this law. So we're just all being lied to constantly all the time by these key institutions of our society. And I'm just going to, I looked up this Hannah Arendt quote that just so fits this moment. If everybody always lies to you, the consequence isn't that you believe the lies, 
or rather that nobody believes anything any longer. It's disorienting, it's destabilizing. I feel like we lose our ability to respond appropriately. And so part of what we wanted to do with this presentation or discussion with you all is like say, let's wake the heck up y'all. Like this is, they are getting rid of abortion. They have effectively gotten rid of the right to abortion. And we, by they, I mean, Texas, Mississippi, the Supreme Court, and this is not the time for us to be in kind of a, a stupor of, you know, whoa, what's happening here? This is a time to say that's what's happening and we're not taking it. We're fighting back. We are never going to submit to this. That is absolutely critical. And the other thing I wanted to say is that um, they're going to use this in other areas. Now that they've gotten away with it, I mean, this was just like an idea that some right wing lawyer had about, hey, what if we did this private enforcement mechanism? And oh my God, it's been amazingly successful. The right wing is completely emboldened now. They're going to use this, I'm sure, for especially probably transgender issues. And they're, I mean, imagine they you can pass a law that says, oh, people have to use the restrooms based on their whatever they're going to call it, biological sex, birth sex. And anybody who's doing who's violating that law, if you see anybody violating that law, you can call it to the attention of the authorities and we'll give you ten thousand dollars. I mean, we're only there's already something kind of happened like that in Tennessee with the school bill where they said anybody who basically they said you could do that to, if a transgender student is using restroom based on their gender identity at school that other people can bring a lawsuit against the school district. So we're already seeing the beginnings of this. Um, so anyhow, that's I'll, I'll stop there and um, kick it back. I think I can't remember to Kathy, uh, Kathy or Julie, but uh, just we need to keep our eyes open. There's going to be much more of this type of thing to come. I see in the chat there was a question. I don't know where the question is, but Kathy's flagging for me. There's a question about out of state. Do you know uh, what? So what's just it? to read, this comes from the Q and A. Okay. Um, just you had to open up that one to see. Um, but I'll just let you know. So this question asked, um, just uh, this was an NPR interview of an abortion provider in Colorado and questioning whether he could be liable under the Texas law who provides abortion to a person who's from Texas coming to Colorado. There, I mean, this is such a novel kind of law that I think it's, we always, lawyers do this anyway. We always caveat like, well, it depends. We don't really know how courts will construe the law, but the way it's being read so far is that the abortion actually has to occur within the state of Texas. The part that's a little bit scary is the aiding and abetting provision. So if you lived in Colorado, but sent a check perhaps to a person to go get to pay for that abortion, that the, the law specifically mentions financing. So the aiding and abetting part is really the, the thing that could be sort of an indefinite web to ensnare so many different people involved. But as far as where the actual abortion occurs, it would have to be within the boundaries of the state of Texas. And that's why, you know, I'll tell you, I was talking about being on the board of ACN. There is a wonderful mobilization happening where the providers in both adjacent states and farther away, letting the providers in Texas know exactly what their schedules are, how far they go, how they can get patients. Like there's, there's mobilizing happening in the community of people who provide care, which is good to know, but it should not have to happen this way. I mean, people shouldn't have to be refugees seeking reproductive health care in this country. Um, so I think um, we were going to talk about kind of what's next and how, how folks can get involved. Um, I think one way is going to sound kind of super vague and maybe not that sexy, but we really just need to bear in mind how all of this stuff is connected. You know, we have to think about when we're voting at the local level, the state level for our, our members of Congress, that this is why it matters who's there. It matters who the president is because they put people on the Supreme Court who then can do things like let this law go into effect. But now that we have a president who supports abortion rights, we have a Department of Justice that is getting involved and trying to shut this down. So being involved, voting, and communicating with your members of Congress and your state legislators about what you think is acceptable and unacceptable. Um, these people are supposed to be accountable to us. The country at large is in support of abortion rights. And yet we keep seeing these laws because I think people are sort of like, oh, it's gonna be fine, it'll all get worked out. It will not if people don't get involved and speak up. There are two specific things around the Texas bill that um, people can get involved in. One is that on October 2nd, there's gonna be a multi-state, I believe a 50 state march in support of reproductive rights. 
Um, it's being organized um, by the Women's March, but all of the main repro groups and state groups are being are involved in that too. So if you can go to the Women's March website, you can find information about getting involved in a march in your area. The other exciting thing that's happening is that there is a bill in Congress called the Women's Health Protection Act that has been introduced um, every year since back in 2014 that would put into federal law the ability of a person to get an abortion. So right now we rely on an interpretation of, of the constitution, which I think is the correct interpretation, but that's really where we look to for a federal protection for abortion rights. But this bill would say, well, you know, even if the Supreme Court messes around with Roe v. Wade or changes the standard, we're gonna have a law, a statute that would protect the right to abortion. And uh, Speaker Pelosi has announced that they're going to, they're, she's going to call a vote on that bill in a couple of weeks, which is huge. Um, I mean, candidly, when you have a very closely divided Congress, you know, having votes on abortion rights is not necessarily what you know, a leader wants to happen because that can be hard for some members who are from conservative areas. But I think you know, Shannon talked about you know, the five alarm fire, that's what this is. And Speaker Pelosi calling this vote means that she agrees with Shannon that this is a five alarm fire and we need to move forward on federal protection. So what folks on the phone can do is reach out to your members of Congress and tell them to vote for the Women's Health Protection Act when it comes to a, a vote um, on the House floor. The Senate is more challenging because it is so closely divided. I don't know if there will be a vote there, but you can still reach out to your senators and tell them to co-sponsor the bill if they haven't already. So the March and the Women's Health Protection Act are two specific things that I would really encourage people to, to get involved in and, and speak up against what's happening. It makes a difference to speak out. I mean, just to clearly say what is going on here, not contribute to the obfuscation and the myths surrounding all this and just be like, no, they're come, they're trying to ban abortion. They're trying to take away the right to abortion for women and that we're not going to stand for it. I hope we see massive civil disobedience. I hope any, I hope any other state that passes a law like this, the people just rise up and say, I'm violating it. I wish there were a million bumper stickers in Texas that said, if you need an abortion, I will help you get one. You know, I mean, I really think we have to get back to our activist roots on this. Um, and, uh, Jesse is is posting some some great messages. I think they might just be showing up for for host, but about like we have to get involved from the lowest level to the you know state local politics, state politics, federal politics. Yeah. The other thing I just wanted to, to call out about again, they're gonna you know we have faced the past two years have been unbelievable. Like this onslaught of anti transgender legislation. NCL are super involved in opposing that. We're on this little break right now. We're most not all, but most state legislatures are on hiatus, but that's about to be over. So we're gearing up to fight those. Uh, what's going to be another wave of anti-transgender laws. We're challenging some of them. We're challenging one that passed in Tennessee right now. I'm sure we'll probably be challenging more of them, but that's something we need everybody on board for. And uh, and we and we also, in the midst of all the defensive work we're doing, we want to, we also still, we really need to do more affirmative work or continue, I should say, to do affirmative work because we need to keep the other side off balance too. Like they're keeping us off balance. We got to think creatively as well. And so, you know, I just wanted to, it helps me to think about some of the positive things that we are doing in that front, which is, you know, our, our campaign in a uh, conversion more perfect is going really, really well. We've got 20 states, DC, more than a hundred localities. I mean, pass those laws. We have been successful so far with one exception in defending them when they get challenged by groups like the Alliance Defending Freedom. I think Reagan Rasnick is on this call. She's our co-counsel right now. We're helping defend Washington's law for protecting youth from conversion therapy. We're, we're reading more and more survivors in administrative complaints and uh, consumer fraud cases. So that's that's a little a little bit of a ray of affirmative affirmative light. And Kathy, I think you were going to mention some other ones. Yeah, I mean, I think that we also do uh, a lot of broader reproductive justice works that is about recognizing families and particularly LGBTQ people having children in all the ways that we do. And we've had a lot of success in a lot of states um, protecting families who are conceived through assisted reproduction uh, and surrogacy, 
recognizing people who function as parents, whether or not they are genetically related to their children, and all of those things that are about honoring our families, the way we choose to create them and whether we choose to create them are all part of the same piece. And we have had a lot of great success in this area in, you know, really recognizing families who use all kinds of ways to conceive, including thinking about how low-income families access assisted reproduction, which I think people really don't think or talk about which is similarly in terms of self-managed care, it can also include for people who have uteruses doing at-home insemination with a known donor. And many states don't recognize that as a path to parentage or as using a donor and not your donor not being a father. Um, those pieces and questions of really looking at how do our communities and families really form themselves are very important to making sure that, that we really can be respected in our family relationships. I also wanted to point out that I think a logical extension in at least in some conservative circles of completely banning abortion potentially also bans IVF um, and the use of, of in vitro fertilization and many forms of assisted reproduction, which of course would prevent many LGBTQ people from becoming parents and effectively ban surrogacy in most states. So I think that also, you know, isn't really a piece that's really widely pushed in conservative circles, but it is somewhat in this idea that, you know, if you, the creation of embryos through IVF also have cannot be cannot pos cannot be destroyed, which does sometimes happen in the process. And so essentially that is also something that is imperiled is even just our ability to access the reproductive technology that is available to us in this country. Yeah, people are asking some really good questions in the chat. I wasn't planning on saying anything about this, but I, I will um, just a little bit since people are asking about it, about the underpinnings of Roe uh, and Casey. It, it, yes. It, it, Historically, primarily, the court has relied on privacy and autonomy doctrine to um, recognize the right to abortion, which is fine. I mean, that's important. I mean, the, and the right to marry, as some, someone has pointed out, Andy pointed that out, is founded in the right to, to autonomy and privacy. Uh, Lawrence striking down uh, laws that criminalize same-sex intimacy was based in the fundamental right to uh, uh, privacy, autonomy, intimate association. This is all true. Um, and I'll just say, you like, uh, strategically, the, there are a majority of justices on the current court who do not believe in the fundamental right to privacy and autonomy, who do not believe in substantive due process, especially new, the recognition of new fundamental rights to which that's what they call it, you know, so they think that there is no fundamental right to abortion. We know that. So one of our strategies is to say, we did talk about the, the right to autonomy. We talked about our burger fell in our brief, but one of our strategies is to pull out uh, the, the other foundation of those cases, which is there, as you see it, especially in Casey, you definitely see it in Obergefell, Lawrence, Windsor, all of the big LGBT rights cases, just equality and equal protection. That is equally fundamental. Those cases that the equality is essential to Casey. I mean, there's that wonderful language about, you know, women can't control their reproductive autonomy. They can't be, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but equal respected participating members of our society and our democracy. So we really hammered on that in our amicus brief. And as I mentioned, also we're making like a straight up sex discrimination argument after Bostock. The way the court analyzed sex discrimination in Bostock, there is just, if you're going to be honest and fair, there is no way after Bostock that a law restricting abortion is not sex discrimination. Of course it is. Pregnancy is a sex-based trait. It be, it, the court has said sexual orientation is a sex-based trait. Transgender status is a sex-based trait. Well, pregnancy is clearly also a sex-based trait. And so laws that restrict pregnancy should be recognized as sex discrimination. So that's part of our strategy is to not put all of our eggs in the privacy autonomy basket because that is in, that's in real jeopardy with this court and we don't wanna make it easy for them. You know, we certainly don't wanna invite them to um, say that, oh, well, if they get rid of, if they, if they back away, let's just say from the fundamental right to autonomy and privacy in Casey, then 
and also undermines Obergefell and, and Lawrence and all those cases. We do not want to make that easy for them. We want to remind them there's a whole other side to those cases and that's equality. And it's gonna be a lot, I mean, even these conservative justices cannot openly say they don't agree with equality and the equal protection clause. So, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to have some strategy here. Uh, the only other thing we wanted to uh, affirmatively put out there today, and then if, if anybody has more questions, uh, we'll, we'll try to get to them, but it's just to remind everyone how very much we need federal protections for our community. I mean, we really do. With the courts getting so conservative, turning against us, let's get real about that. I mean, this, the Supreme Court letting this Texas abortion ban go into effect was, it sh it's shocking. And it's, we knew this was a bad court. Oh my gosh, it's a really bad court. And we're seeing losses on our issues. You know, the, the, all the Trump judges on the federal bench, we're starting to see that and feel that. And it is, could not be more clear that we urgently need Congress to codify Bostock, to put sexual orientation and gender identity into federal law. It, that'll make it much more difficult for the courts to, you know, rule against us. And it will give us the kind of security and nationwide protection that we, we urgently, urgently need. So I don't know, it's with so much going on these days, the, the federal protections, the Equality Act, uh, I worry that it doesn't, it doesn't have the prominence, the visibility, the attention in the community that we have to have if we're going to pass it. So wherever the heck you live, just I hope you're bugging the heck out of your senators and representatives every day telling them we've got to have this law absolutely we've got to have pass federal protections and if you're not just do it because that's it's going to take that from all of us i'm just looking here to see if there's any la any last questions in the q a shannon why you're think julie had something to add yeah, well, Shannon, maybe while you're scanning the, the questions, I was just, Kathy, you put it so well earlier when you kind of linked, you know, the abortion fight to the broader work that NCLR does. And really, I mean, I when I think about how NCLR was created or the, the real big impetus for it being created was because, you know, back in the 70s, courts were saying, well, lesbians, just by virtue of who we are, like, shouldn't be parents. Like, they wanted to take away the ability to parent. And I really see... Um, pushing back against states forcing parenthood on people to be really the other side of the coin. Like it should be up to us. Um, we get to decide whether and when to, to become parents. But there's also, um, Kathy, you mentioned um, like self, self care that people, you know, sometimes go outside of the formal healthcare system to, to pursue family creation and, and get the care they need. And that, that also happens in, in the abortion context. And I think one of the things that's um, important in our, when we talk about what's happening with these abortion restrictions is that we don't fall back to some of the older messaging like, oh, this is gonna send women to back alleys. And if women take matters into their own hands and, and you know, take medicine to have abortions, that it's a, a bad thing. Now, obviously we want it to be safe, but we also, it's very important that we recognize that there's a growing recognition that you know, people taking into their own hands how to end a pregnancy, if that's what they want to do, is a good thing as long as, you know, they have access to good information and the right medication. So, um, again, sometimes the older messaging that used to work maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago is, is not really relevant today. And we don't want to demonize the fact that some people do go outside the, the formal healthcare system to vindicate their rights and to form form their families on their on their own terms. And, you know, maybe it's a it's a way to remind ourselves there, there actually are some good things happening in the movement for reproductive health rights and justice. You know, we, we have a lot of setbacks, we have a lot of uphill battles, but we've also made some progress. You know, when I started in that movement 10 years ago, you know, I, you couldn't go into a member of, of Congress's office on Capitol Hill and talk to them about getting rid of the Hyde Amendment, right? That's a terrible federal policy that's enacted year after year that says no federal money can pay for abortion care, and it really affects largely women on the Medicaid program. And, you know, members of Congress are so skittish in talking about abortion that you couldn't even ask them to think about voting against the Hyde Amendment. They would almost throw you out of their office because it seemed like, I know there are a lot of third rails in politics, but it definitely was one. Here we are 10 years later, this year for the first time, the Hyde Amendment is not in the president's budget. It's not in the federal appropriations bills. There is a proactive bill to get rid of the Hyde Amendment that has hundreds of co-sponsors 
in Congress. And that is all due to the work of reproductive justice organizations led by women of color who frankly stood up and said, you know what, we're tired of this because this is really impacting our communities. You know, white women, people, women with money can get around things like the Hyde Amendment, but not everybody can. So I just, even though we haven't quite gotten rid of Hyde yet, I think we need to sometimes allow ourselves a minute to look at the progress that we've made and, and see how far we have come. Um, so anyway, I just uh, I wanted to pick up on a couple of Kathy's threads and, and, and add, add some of that. Thanks so much. Yeah, well, I don't know. I think we probably can just wrap up unless anybody else has anything else to add. Uh, we don't want to take more time than, than we need to like, you know, get this messages out to everyone and just basically tell y'all what we're doing and kind of how we're seeing the, these issues. I mean, I, I'm more concerned than I've ever been in like 30 years of NCLR, but like I said, we are not even close to giving up. I mean, we know what to do when stuff like this happens. And the critic, I feel confident as long as we do fight back and we don't lose our collective sense of urgency and focus, the long run, we're going to be okay, but we're about to go through a hell of a time, I think. Kathy or Julie, any last thoughts? There is one last question, Shannon, in the Q&A um, that says, absent a constitutional amendment, do you see a path that the right can obtain a national ban on abortion? I don't think nationally, I don't, I don't think that even this Supreme Court would, would say that there it would switch from saying there's a fundamental right to abortion to switching to say that you know a fetus has a fundamental right to not be aborted in effect. I don't see anything, but I can seriously if but if they get rid of the fundamental right to abortion and just kick it all back to the states, I absolutely can see some state Supreme Courts issuing rulings like that under state constitutions. Yeah. So we're going to have to, I mean, which would be intolerable. I mean, we have got to really be vigilant about, I mean, some of the state courts right now are really terrible too. So, you know, organizing at the state level is, is, is going to be super important. It's not, it's not all about uh, federal stuff in the states, in the Supreme Court. State courts matter too. Yeah, Shannon, I think that's right. It would be, I mean, a lot of what those who, are, who try to get Roe or urge Roe to be overturned say it should be left to the states. And that's what, you know, dissenters in Supreme Court cases have said is that it would be up to each state. So I don't know that we would see a national ban on abortion, but, and I don't have the number in front of me, many states have what are called trigger laws on their books right now that say the moment Roe is overturned, abortion will be banned in this state. So they don't even have to do any more work if the Supreme Court guts or overturns the current federal protection, constitutional protection, it'll just kind of happen automatically. They're just, well, that's why they're called trigger laws. So um, it wouldn't be necessarily nationwide, but there would be large swaths of this country where the right would, would effectively be out of reach. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Julie, thanks for the final words. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. You know, it's always a priority for us whenever something like this happens to try to get out in front of you all to just give a briefing and let you know what's what's going on. I'm so happy we were able to do that today. Um, you know, you you heard from everyone here. Um, go contact your um, your representatives. Um, let folks know that this is not something that that will stand for. Um, get out in front of people. This is the thing to do. So. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, have a great uh, rest of your night and be, be great today. Take care. Thank Bye you, everyone. everyone.